Thank you, everyone. All right, so I put together a presentation, but I wasn't sure if I was going to use the beginning of this because I didn't know if you guys were ready for it. But based on everything I've seen so far, I think you guys are ready. But it is going to be audience participation. So the question is, are you willing to audience participate with me? Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. This is going to involve a little bit of maybe getting outside your comfort zone, but I'm sure that you can do it. I get it. 
It's like I'm telling you something you didn't know. Well, the truth is, is that time does march on. So let's identify which generation you're in. How many people here in this room are Generation Y identified as those between age 20 and 30? Show of hands. How many? One. Okay. That's unfortunate. And there's a reason that there's only one Gen Y here in the audience. Because they don't think they need stuff like this. They don't think they need inspiration. They don't think they need a lot of things that we're here offering today. Do you get that? Yeah. So when I do these workshops, I know my audience. I know you guys. I don't know you individually. I maybe didn't get a chance to speak to you all individually. But I know what you've been through. And we've been through a lot. I'm going to share a little bit about my experiences. Because I'm a baby boomer. We've been through a lot. The Gen X's right now are between age 30 and age 50. And can I see a show of hands of how many of you are going to be brave enough to then say that? Okay. That means the rest of you are baby boomers. The baby boomers, you want to go ahead and get those creaky knees in order and stand up and give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> okay, the baby boomers, the baby boomers were born between the baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. They were the first generation to actually be so significant that they created a movement, that I created a movement, that you all created a movement, about 73 million strong right now. We are a force to be reckoned with, but we're facing some challenging times, and unfortunately many baby boomers feel that their best days are behind them. Any of you boomers out there feel that your best days are behind them? All right, well, if you do, I've got about 27 more minutes to tell you why that's not true. So let's do a little test to find out whether you're a baby boomer or not. How many people here remember what this is? It's not a place, Matt. Yeah. This is how we used to listen to music. What a nuisance it was. You had to put it on a machine, put this thing on top of it, put a needle on it, and after three and a half minutes it was done. I had to wait like 30 seconds for the next song. What a nuisance it was, right? All right. How many of you remember these? Oh, yeah. If you remember this, you're aging yourself. Rotary phones. Yes. You had to put your finger in each individual hole and dial it. I got calluses. Got calluses, exactly. Well, you know what? If you're calling one or two, that's okay. But when you had to dial zero, you had to wait like 12 seconds for that sucker to come back, right? <laughs> so, now this one is a test of pop culture. And was it you, young lady, that has a website on pop culture? All right, so let's see if you know who this is. <laughs> oh, that's the guy that goes, oh, no. Mr. Bill. Terry, what does Mr. Bill say? Oh, no. Oh, no, Mr. Bill. <laughs> I know you think he's whacked. I know you think I'm whacked. But look it up, including you, young ladies. I know who you know Mr. Bill. She knows Mr. Bill. I'm so here's the they deal. They smash him all the time. Mr. Bill was a staple on Saturday Night Live, which, by the way, is still on. Yeah. About 40 years after it went on the one on the air. And Mr. Bill was a very iconic figure. Well, here's the deal. Today, we have in this little device right here, our record player, okay. our telephone, mm -hmm. and we have the ability to watch Saturday Night Live on this. Right. So, the question I have for you, has the world changed? Yes. yes. Is the world going to continue to change? Yes. yes. Are you going to change with it? Yes. yes. You have no choice. Change or die. <laughs> I found it so interesting this morning when I got here that Rita said that she wanted me and all the other speakers to give you three takeaways. And anyone want to venture a guess on how many takeaways I'm giving you this morning? Three. This afternoon? Three. So, change, baby. Change. How many of you here have businesses? All right. You must change the way you do business. You want to say that with me? You must change the way you do business. Not you should, not you will, not you can, but you must 
change the way you do business. Because I have been what I call an unemployable entrepreneur for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion with Kimberly earlier today and she just left the, business, the corporate world to becoming an entrepreneur because she's a radical, she's a rebel, and she was surprised by that. And I said, embrace it. Uh -huh. I'm a highly unemployable entrepreneur, not because I'm a distraction, but because as an employee, don't you always see things that your employer should be doing different or doing better? Yeah. Isn't that what creates entrepreneurship? Yes. Yeah. So the question is, are entrepreneurs made or are they born? How many people think entrepreneurs are born? Show of hands. How many people believe entrepreneurs are made? Show of hands. How many people don't give a crap? No. <laughs> Okay, say crap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you said it twice. <laughs> so I can give you the abridged version of this talk, or I can give you the very direct version of this talk. Which would you like? Direct. 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 All right, good. Because I don't have time to bullshit anybody. <laughs> and uh, before I move on, I just wanted to, Rita, I have an announcement for you, and I didn't even mention it to you earlier, but how many people here are related to Rita? Show of hands. <laughs> well, actually, I have good news and I have bad news. Sister! <laughs> You're the one! Yes, I'm the one. I'm the brother from another mother. <laughs> And I saw some mighty strange looking sisters that raised their hand while ago, so I might have to <laughs> <laughs> more than 10, could be 11, could be 12. All right, so how many people here are entrepreneurs? Show of hands. How many people would like to be entrepreneurs but don't know how to do it? All right, so here's the thing. In my opinion, this is my opinion only, entrepreneurs are more born than made. However, you can help someone that has an entrepreneurial spirit become a better entrepreneur. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Like, for instance, young, uh, young Kimberly here, who left her corporate job, who wants to become an entrepreneur because she's had this rebellious spirit in her for decades. It just didn't have a chance to what? Get out. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is that you as entrepreneurs, you as those who wish to be entrepreneurs, yours is to do, yours, you who want to become better entrepreneurs, what are you going to do differently to change the way you do business? Because here's the reality of the marketplace. I just wrote a book called Success at Any Age, The Baby Boomer and Gen Y's Guide to Becoming an Overnight Success. And this was a very personal journey for me because I became an entrepreneur officially when I was about 26 years old. And for years, we didn't use the word entrepreneur. Right. We were just what? Self-employed. We were just what? Doing our own thing. Today, it's easy to identify entrepreneurs. There's all kinds of websites. There's all kinds of support groups. There's all kinds of training organizations. They teach it in colleges, for darn sake. But there's a reality between calling yourself an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur. Is that all right? So I spent many, many years doing a lot of different things. I've had some successes, and man, have I had my share of failures. How many of you have ever failed in a business venture? Show of hands there. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> because here's the thing. You can't go into this wild-eyed and bushy-tailed with rose-colored glasses thinking you're going to get it right the first time. Right. Or the second time. Or the third time. It used to be easier, but the reality of it is, for many decades, the world moved along very slowly. The 60s, the 70s, the 80s you could probably do what had been done the previous 10, 20, even 30 years, and you could get away with it. The world changed about 20 years ago with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the flattening of the earth, the internet, with technology, and it's continuing. And I'll guarantee you this, it is not going to stop. So if you think that you know exactly how the world is going to proceed, you better think again. Get your ego in check, because the reality of it is, change is inevitable. So you have to have the mind of an entrepreneur, and the road to change is not easy, is it? No. There's no road map. It's like this. It's jiggling, and the road is up and down, and it's sideways, and the lights are blurred and everything. It's not a clear-cut path. But there are things that you can do to improve it. There's things that you can do to make it better. So. My goal over the next 15 minutes is to rock your world and give you some ways 
to improve your likelihood of changing. Is that okay? Yeah. You guys still want to play? Yeah. I bet you think I'm here to sell something, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I said yeah. Okay, you're right there. But that's not my main goal. My main goal is to do a little mind meld with you. I want to change the way you do your thinking. You like the word mind meld? I can't do the Vulcan thing, I'm sorry. It's an inside joke for anyone who knows Star Trek. All right, so let's talk about the youngest. They don't like it when I call them youngins, but it's better than little, you know what. So the Gen Ys have it right. They have a lot of things going for them. They have no rules. At great expense, at a great personal risk, I infiltrated the Gen Y organization. And I found a rule book. That's it. That's how big it is. Want to read it to you? Doesn't take very long. There are no rules. Say again. There are no rules. So while the Boomers and while the Gen Xs are having to reinvent themselves, what are the Gen Ys doing? Being. They're being. They don't have to re-anything. They're just inventing. They have no blinders. They have no walls. They have no excuses. And they're okay if they fail. But the Gen Ys have some things going against them, too. And fortunately, there's only one in the room, so I'm only going to assault one person. <laughs> the Gen Ys have more things right the not. And what happened is, as I started to write this book, everyone has a motivation for doing things. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, the motivation for me to write my book was fear. It was fear. I spent many years in real estate, financial planning, I had a radio show, and everything was doing great until 2008. And in 2008, what do you think happened? Yeah. My world got cut off. Everything I had done for 30 years, real estate, financial services, investments, the radio show, it all went away within several months. And to figure out what the heck does Norm want to do with his life now. I was about 50, 54 years old. So I got involved in the world of business, and I got involved with SCORE, a great organization. I became a SCORE trainer. I got involved with SBA. I did workshops and focus groups, including one with the city of Corona out here. I became a partner in this company called Opus Network, and that's how I met <coughs> wonderful Retha here, because we, for the last three years, have been doing workshops in partnerships with cities, offering the cities a way to be business friendly by reaching out and supporting the business community, because all the business community wants help, and they're turning to the cities and saying, help me, what can you do? And what are the cities saying? Nothing. I have no idea, what are you talking about? You're asking in English and responding in Spanish. There's a, there's a disconnect there. So the reality of it is, is they, that's not their bandwidth, that's not their mindset, that's not within their, their wheelhouse. You know, you can give it all the cliches you want. So we as a company have gone in over the last three years and have done workshops with thousands of different students. And we teach people how to reinvent themselves, how to be competitively, how to competitively position themselves, how to be accountable to themselves and to others. So I've learned a lot from businesses over the last three years. But about six months ago, my world started tumbling down again. Because I don't know how many of you are familiar with the redevelopment agencies, but in California we have this thing called the redevelopment agencies, which funded money to the cities that I had embraced and had embraced me over the last three years, and now that money was gone. Now all these wonderful people within city governments that I had a relationship with, they were at risk of losing their jobs. I'm thinking, oh, crap. Sorry, I did it again. <laughs> what am I going to do now? Because that was my lot. That was my position. That was my role as community development director, forming relationships with cities and reaching out. So I went into a major stress mode, and I thought I was going to die. That's not an exaggeration. I'm sorry if you yawned on that. And no, I just... <laughs> <laughs> Boring to me too, I know. <laughs> Let's hear it for our wonderful lunch table. <laughs> now she's going to put me on a television show out of obligation to come out. <laughs> so what happened is I reached a point of pain where I said to myself, look at all that's happened over the last 30 years. What kind of legacy Am I leaving my children and my grandchildren? We heard several speakers, several people this morning speaking about 
what's inside of you? What are you going to die with inside of you? And what was inside of me was this story that I'd actually thought about three years ago about how to become an overnight success after 30 years of busting your behind. Mm -hmm. I thought about that when the radio show went by the wayside and I kind of put it in the back of my mind and there it stayed for many, many years until I reached that low point last fall. I was in deep financial trouble. My marriage of 25 years was pretty much gone. And I thought, if I don't get this story out, how sad would that be? So that was my motivator. So the question is, is what's your motivator? What's your motivator to start that business? What's your motivator to change the way you do things? Everyone reaches that, <clears throat> that point of pain. And until you reach that point of pain, you might be too stubborn for your own good. So I started researching a book and reaching out to baby boomers nationwide, and I also reached out to the Gen Ys and the Gen Xs, and I found some things that I was not expecting. I interviewed several dozen people all over the United States and Canada, and what I saw was great brilliance in these Gen Ys. They don't have to adapt. We have to adapt. They don't have to change. They just have to do. So I thought, wow, interesting. We as baby boomers have a lot of one thing that they do not have any of. Anyone want to venture a guess what that is? Age. Besides age, I'm thinking. <laughs> Wisdom. Experience. That's the one thing that you cannot recreate or duplicate. It is what it is. And unfortunately, the Gen Ys uh, don't have everything right. So I have been an advocate of mentorship, which we've heard discussed several times today, for several years. For the last three years, we have been attempting to put mentorship centers and incubators into local city governments, but that's way too abstract for them. So, what came out of the book research was that, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You've got the baby boomers out there that are having a hard time changing, right? Right. You've got the Gen Ys out there that understand technology, that understand social media, but when they hit a wall, what do you think happens? They fall apart. They crumble. They are an enabled generation. They are a spoiled generation. You've heard this before. Gen Ys make bad employees, especially if you're a boomer hiring them. Because work the yeah, yeah, you agree? Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing. The baby boomers, the ones born 46 to 54, 46 to 64, we were raised with a different mindset. We were raised with a hard scrap mentality. We were raised to work. Yeah? yeah? Gen X's were also raised to work, but they have some wonderful attributes because they also have a better understanding of technology, right? right. So the reality of it is, is that to try to be a baby boomer and create a business and create success and compete against a Gen Y, is it a fair fight? No. no. Because while we, as baby boomers, are texting one. <laughs> Sorry. What? You got him. You got him. You don't like to use him. This is the worst thing about. What's well, the second worst thing about getting old? I forget the first one. <laughs> Time, they're surfing the internet, listening to music, and texting their friends, and they're doing it all reasonably well. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 I live down in South Orange County where we have this marine base called Camp Pendleton, so the analogy I use is like Camp Pendleton Marines having a paintball fight against the Girl Scouts of Orange County. It's not, it ain't a fair fight. But what I saw was great brilliance in the baby boomers. I'm not sure how I went backwards, but I did. So what I saw was an opportunity for what I call convergence, to bring these two generations together. And the goal is to create what I call a two-year success plan. Now, here's what I found in my research. As I interviewed these Gen Ys, and they, by the way, were more numerous and easier to engage than the baby boomers because they like to brag, they like to share. So I interviewed several of them that in two years, in two years, I've been able to create a multi-million dollar business. Pretty impressive, huh? Mm -hmm. 
yeah. surprised me. Now here's what's interesting. I didn't pick anyone that did this in a high-tech area. There's no web geniuses, no game designers. These people, these young little sons of guns. <laughs> <laughs> these little son of a guns have been able to do it in low-tech, blue-collar, low-to-middle-tech type of businesses. Why? Why? How are they doing it? Now, I have a, a gentleman over there by the name of Dan Fallon, who I've happened to know for 10 years. Dan teaches social media. That's the deal maker. These young people, these Gen Ys, they understand social media. They have been integrated with it since the beginning. We think that we are social media savvy because we have a Facebook account. Woohoo! <laughs> we have a LinkedIn account. Wow! I've got a Twitter account. Yay! Now what? <laughs> now what? I've got 14 friends. Yeah. <laughs> I've got all these people like me. Who cares? Who cares? These people know how to use social media to create a multi-million dollar business. I envy the craft. I envy the heck out of them. I envy them. I respect them for their skills, I respect them for their knowledge and for their technology. So my thoughts was, why don't we create a way for the baby boomers to team with the Gen Ys, and the Gen Ys to team with the baby boomers. Aha! So that's the direction that my book went. So let's talk about how we actually create this paradigm shift, because that's really what it is. And I call it the new economic paradigm. Because here's the thing, guys. The world has changed. We, as a country, are a military superpower. We will always remain a superpower, but we are not the economic superpower that we once were. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. China will always outdo us when it comes to manufactured goods. India will exceed us with intellect. In order for Indian students to get into a university, they would run rings out of our best students. Yes. 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 Within another couple of generations, the Indian population will exceed China. Right. Whoa! How do you compete against that? Well, the problem is, is, over the last several generations, we here in the United States have been brought up to be quote-unquote workers. Our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandfathers were workers. I've never been able to play in that game, so I've always been an entrepreneur. So my goal is to create more entrepreneurs, teach them how to be better entrepreneurs, teach them how to create jobs. Are you okay with that? Yes. yes. So, I call it the new economic paradigm, and how is this going to take place? It's going to take place by creating entrepreneurial incubators. Mm -hmm. Now, incubators is a term you've probably heard of before, but it has very limited application. Usually they're used for high-tech, biotech companies, for venture capitalists and angelists to bring these brilliant minds together so they can take this company public and they can rape, rape and pillage. I believe that incubators should be available for you, and for you, and for you and for you in any and every business. Imagine this. Imagine that we had a room like this comprised of baby boomers and Gen Ys getting to know each other on a regular ongoing basis, finding where their businesses and their mindsets and their personalities resonate with each other, and creating businesses together. Wow! Right. Don't hire them! Team with them. Right. Partner with them. They, the Gen Ys, need our guidance. Do you agree with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I went to a workshop a little while ago, and they actually had a term for that. So like I said, as Generation Y is as good as they are, you know, they still have some limitations. This is a cartoon I saw a couple days ago. The, uh, the uh, what do you call this? The, the, the wise man is saying to the young guy, you want to attain nirvana, but you don't want to pray, meditate, or abandon all of your earthly desires. What do you want me to do? Just hand it to you? I seek the path to entitlement. <laughs> <laughs> Not empowerment, entitlement. So I had to use it, I'm sorry, but I love cartoons. I'm still a kid at heart. The reality of it is, is that they think they're entitled, and so they need our help. There was an article in the paper a few days ago about their social skills would suck. They're good with technology, they're good with texting, but they can't communicate face to face. I'll never forget when I would leave a message for my granddaughter, and she wouldn't call me back, but I would get a text back. Thanks, right. Papa. Thanks for calling. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. I got hurt. 
Right. How many of you have texted a young person or left a message for a young person and they texted you back? Show of hands. <laughs> a couple weeks ago was Mother's Day. 23% of mothers got a happy Mother's Day via text. Right. Yeah. Not a call, not a visit, not a card, a text. They don't think it's rude. They don't think it's disrespectful. Right. They don't think anything. They right. think that that's the way it is. Right. So the thing is, are we <laughs> going to change them? Are we going to change them? No. One more time. Are we going to change them? No. Who has to change? We do. So, how many people here are willing to change? Show of hands. Right. Just making Not sure. Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> I'll work on you. It's always the stubborn one in the crowd. I went to a workshop, and it was a wonderful scientific workshop on gerontology, and one of the gerontologists there came up with a term called Mises Sapientia. It's Latin. It's called harvesting the wisdom. I thought, wow, that's a really, really cool term. So I thought, I'm going to steal it. And I did. <laughs> her name is Carrie, so I'll give her credit. So here's the reality of it. We as baby boomers, we've had our share of struggles. Most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Anyone want to tell me who wrote that? Come on now, the famous uh, line. Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. Most men die with a song in their heart and lead lives of quiet desperation. <coughs> so I guess the question is, is that are you going to continue to be desperate? Or are you going to be making a change in your life? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to change? Are you willing to try something new? Because about 24 minutes ago, I said to you, I've got 30 minutes to rock your world, so I'm running out of time. <laughs> is your world getting rocked yet? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Just because you fail does not make you a failure. Success is a state of mind. Yes. It took me a while to realize that because I thought I was a failure. Because I had failed way too many times. One of the biggest motivators that kept me from giving up was my mother. And my book is dedicated to my mother who was a Holocaust survivor. My mother was on one of the first trains in Auschwitz and she didn't get out until the war was ended in January of 1945. So she spent three years in hell that we can't imagine. I don't care what kind of stuff you've been through, nothing is like that. The failures that I've had, they're nothing like that. So she didn't try to be an inspiration, she just was an inspiration. And you all have people in your lives that are like that too. They don't try to do anything, they just are. There's wonderful speakers who this morning spoke and they inspired, they motivated you. And we need people like that. We need people to inspire you because sometimes we give up hope, right? right? So the first rule I gave you was that you must change the way you do business. And the second rule I gave you was there are no rules. So sometimes the difference between success and failure is very, 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 very slim. You know, we've heard the analogies that, you know, the finish line is right there, but people give up. So the point I want to make is that for all of you who are entrepreneurs or those of you who wish to be entrepreneurs, don't give up. Because sometimes victory is not that far apart. Here comes the sales pitch. <laughs> this is the book that I wrote called Success at Any Age, The Baby Boomers and Gen Y's Guide to Becoming an Overnight Success. I've been beta testing it for the last few months, so hardly anyone has seen it, but I bought six copies with me, which I'm selling today for basically $20. But I'm going to give you a reason that you buy the book today because I'm going to give you some extra special perks. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. All right. So the book has been in test release because what I've been doing is that I've been doing speeches like this and I've been selling it online. I've been embraced by the media for the first time in a decade because I've done a lot of media work, a lot of PR work, and I've had like six interviews over the last 60 days. So I've had a lot of print media, a lot of radio interviews, and uh, it seems to resonate with people. People are understanding that there's great wisdom in the Gen Y is not just brilliance, but they need to be able to tap into it. So I'm creating a vehicle for them to tap into it. So, you know, I'm a partner in a company called Opus Network. We provide peer-to-peer -peer classes, mastermind classes, mentor-to-mentor -mentor classes. We teach understand competitive positioning, viral marketing, integrating SEO, and I want you to buy the book, and here's why. So, I have seven books with me. And for the, the people who buy that book, and it's only for those seven people, we as a company at Opus Network, we teach monthly classes. And it's held the second Thursday of every month. Rita has been to one. Pearl has been to one. Rita, did we put people's feet to the fire? Yes, we 
Do we accept excuses? No, you don't. So this was an after, you know, we do a 100-day program in partnerships with cities, and we make people work. We don't accept excuses because we won't let you get away with anything because you don't owe it, you owe it to yourself to not get yourself away with anything. So what I'm going to do is that I brought just a handful of books. I brought basically seven applications for anyone who wants a book for $20, you will get the next two months of mastermind classes for free. It's $100 a month normally, soon to go up to $500 a month. Normally we allow new students to come in for one free visit. They can, they can sit, they can kick the tires and see if it's something that they wish to do. So we have the live class, which is the second Thursday of every month, and then two weeks after that we have a telephone call, and it's all designed to get you to work. It's all designed to make you accountable. Now, how many people here are familiar with Concordia University? Show of hands. All right, a faith-based school in Orange County that we are now teaming up with. They love this idea of the mentorship centers, and we are going to be moving our mastermind classes to Concordia, and we're going to be creating regional, regional centers. The young gentleman who spoke about mentorship, I caught him in the hallway because this is something I'm very passionate about. So you heard the speakers earlier talk about what is your mission, what is your passion, what is it that you don't want to die with inside of you. This is my mission. This is my goal, is to be able to help baby boomers reinvent themselves. You hear this term all the time, reinvent, and it's a great cliche, it's a great throw out, but the thing is, is that no one tells you how to do it. We're going to teach you how to do it. So the first takeaway I gave you was you must change the way you do business and there are no rules. Here's number three, are you ready? You may lose confidence, but never lose hope. I lost confidence, you've lost confidence, and I lost hope too. And the book saved my life. And that sounded a little overdramatic, but the reality is, is that the book saved my life. It took me out of a very bad place because it gave me a reason, it gave me a cause, it gave me a focus, and we heard people talk about focusing earlier today. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the focus of my life, it is to help you get out of your own way. And I like cliches, I like sayings, and you know, there's a couple things I mentioned in the book that will resonate with people, and one of the chapter headings is actually called, Where Does Religion or Spirituality Figure into All This? And the answer is, it really doesn't, but it should. It should. So regardless of your religious affiliation or denomination, you know, there's a higher calling, there's a higher purpose for all of us. And the book was a very cathartic experience for me, and one of the expressions that I made up and I got out of it was that I knew one person could make a difference. I just didn't know it was me. I want you all to say that out loud. I knew one person could make a difference. I just didn't know it was me. Why should she succeed? Why should he succeed? Why not you? Why not you? No one has an answer for that other than making excuses. So don't make excuses. Make yourself significant in your own world, in the world of others. Make a change. Create a difference. And I thank you so much for listening to my conversation with you.